well. Demented but clever body transformation horror movies that will leave your soul shaken. Transformation horror is one of the more intriguing subgenres in filmmaking. Not only does it scare you by its visual aptitude, but it also thrills you with its psychologically distorted attitude. At first, there are visually disgusting depictions of the unknown monstrosity, and then, just as you prepare to recover from it, your mind is thrown into the pit of terror by the fear of losing control over the body, a sense of losing your identity. These films don't deal with death as the final assault, but something more sinister. It's the fear of living like an undead or a monster. The subgenre is definitely not for the faint-hearted, as was proven by the works of David Cronenberg. He delivered a series of grisly and gut-churning films like The Fly and Shiver that were deep-dyed in terror. We would have been late by a decade or so if Cronenberg didn't introduce us with his classics that took body transformation to the level of biological horror. Yet fiction was familiar with such themes. Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein in the early 19th century and then came the pioneer of cosmic and body horror in the form of H.P. Lovecraft. In this video, we will refrain from talking about the obvious choices like The Fly or John Carpenter's The Thing as we have thrown enough light upon them in our previous videos, and instead, we'll focus on films that need a rewatch from the point of view of body transformation horror. Before we go into our list, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click from you, but it means a lot to us. Thank you. Let's begin. Cut you up. But you know what? You're not gonna waste any more of my time. You half breed piece of shit! I'm gonna just fucking kill you myself. District 9, 2009. As the home planet of prawn-like aliens dies, its inhabitants seek refuge on Earth. In a massive spaceship, they land in Johannesburg, South Africa in 1982. These prawns don't intend to dominate Earth or kill humans and only need a safe haven to thrive. Initially, they are given a warm welcome and greetings by humans, but are later subjected to torture and experimentation in a militarized ghetto facility called District 9. The highly advanced extraterrestrials are confined and exploited by Multinational United for their technology. Wickes Vandemer, an operative of the corporation, gets exposed to a foreign chemical that is altering his DNA and making him go through body transformations. What are you doing? Can you grip that? What, what is this? It's helping. Put it through. Why are you doing that? If he has not helped, he will soon mutate into a prawn, depending on them for survival. Neil Blomkamp's District 9 deals with various social issues that plague humanity while revolving around vulgar-looking aliens and body transformations. It's a visually satisfying film that evokes attention and interest in a powerfully irresistible way. Wickes accidentally gets sprayed with a suspicious canister of alien fluid that slowly turns him into one of the aliens lest he gets help. You, you, sir, sir, please, sir, you have to help me. I'm losing blood. They're trying to kill me. Please. The mutation begins with his left arm, and his body gradually becomes a spectacle of body horror as it transforms. Interestingly, the prawns were given human emotions and psychological characteristics, whereas he was shown as a brute thug at the beginning. Wickes becomes more sympathetic and empathetic towards the aliens. The designs were made by Weta Workshop and executed by Image Engine. Come near me, Amaris, ever again. Afflicted, 2013. Derek and Cliff are best friends who decide to travel the world and live life like there's no tomorrow. Derek is suffering from an arteriovenous malformation which can kill him at any moment. The two friends pit stop in Barcelona where they meet Audrey whom Derek tells about his disease. The two of them get into a one night stand, but later Cliff finds that Derek is bitten and soaked in blood. After, Derek begins developing burns from mere sunlight and over the next few days gains superhuman strength and stamina. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. You just broke the wall. The friends get into a brawl, and Derek beats someone only to lick their blood off his hands. Cliff is now sure that Derek was afflicted with vampirism by Audrey, and he will have to find her as she is the only one who can cure his friend. Afflicted is a found footage horror film and does a great job. It keeps you hooked and you want to discover what will happen next. 
Derek Lee and Cliff Prose, who star as Derek and Cliff, have written and directed this point-of-view horror. It is typical of vampire films to delve on the protagonist's attempt at killing the blood-consuming beasts. By breaking that culture, the writers focus on how one becomes a vampire. Your body will not let you starve! Are you insane? You I can't keep killing people! If we think about it, changing from a human to a blood-sucking beast from the mythologies must be a reasonably excruciating process. Derek and Cliff have gone ahead of their caliber to show the intricate details of the process. They slaughter pigs and attack ambulances, but nothing seems to help. Blood! I need blood! Do, do you have any blood? I need blood! Do you, do you have any blood? Speaking any further would give away spoilers, but we assure you that this low-budget film has more than a few tricks up its sleeve to give you shivers and chills. Contracted, 2013. In a morgue, BJ rapes a corpse that has a biohazard tag on its toe. He then goes to a house party where he roofies and rapes a girl named Samantha. The next morning, Samantha wakes up with heavy vaginal bleeding and rashes. She visits a doctor who suggests it's a sexually transmitted infection that she has contracted. Samantha's condition deteriorates further, and her body starts to transform into something diabolical and inhuman. She loses friends and seeks to infect others. In terms of the uncomfortable, Contracted begins high, goes low, and gradually reaches the same height in a sequence of gut-churning events. The assault on a biohazardous corpse is where the film begins, and sex continues to be the dominating theme. The film was shot with a very low budget, but it turned out to be a blessing in disguise for director Eric England. He went ahead with practical and visual effects that only raised the ick factor. As a body transformation horror due to infections, there is grim gore. The day after the assault, Samantha's morning begins with her white bed and clothes drenched in vaginal blood. The decay continues with her eyes becoming animalistic with unusually bright red pupils. She loses chunks of hair, and her teeth fall off while brushing. She sheds maggots out of her crotch while making love. Throughout, she has been ejecting blood and other fluids from her mouth. Remarkably, this decay of her body is at an equal pace with that of her mind. She starts to lose her sanity and become more violent. In one of the scenes, she kills her friend by chewing off her throat. England layers this with relatable social issues among youngsters like self-deception and denial. Samantha's decline and her ultimate perishing are reflective of a deeper problem. Victim, 2010. A mad doctor abducts a young man to turn him into a woman. He is kept in what looks like an amalgamation of a dungeon and a laboratory. The poor man is subjected to various physical and psychological tortures. While the film continues, subtle hints are given as to why the sociopathic scientist wants this man to go through such an intense identity change, but the answer is not given out until the end. The why and how behind the plot become the real reasons behind your screams and chills. It's complicated to talk about Victim without giving away spoilers, but we will try to convey a fair idea about the transformation of the titular character. It is scary to be forced into living life with a new identity, an identity that we can never relate to. Directors Matt Escondery and Michael A. Pierce reveal the intent or the shocking secret only at the end of the movie, but achieve something much greater in the process. The film is not a typical gory transformation horror, and it impacts your psyche to the extent that the viewer stares at the screen even as the end credits roll. One is left so traumatized and immersed in the experience that they will naturally think of the various possibilities of the young man's new life. As discussed, Victims answers several questions that it poses, but one of them remains unanswered and is for the viewer to decide. Who is the real victim? Please, please don't, please. <laughs> Fight, 2015. Casey goes to Costa Rica with her friends Jill and Kirsten for her bachelorette trip. While swimming, she is bitten by an out-of-this-world bug. I'll tell him. Ah! What? 
More worried about her upcoming wedding, Casey ignores the bite and returns home, only to find her body go through a series of changes like weaving webs, excreting a multitude of eggs from her vagina, and discharging chitinous fluids from her oral and other cavities. It is a gross, gooey galore. Bite is known to have made people nauseous at the screenings, and the makers of the film decided to distribute barf bags. Throw-up bags were common for films like Wrong Turn and The Hills Have Eyes, but who would have expected an indie picture like this to reach the same levels of horrendous disturbance? After the first 10 minutes, viewers are taken on a gore ride. Casey transforms into a humanoid bug, and the gradual metamorphosis is filmed with explicit detail. There's no stopping the infectious insect from taking over Casey's body and mind. From developing pus-filled wounds to laying thousands of larvae from her vagina, and coughing up mushy, poisonous substances, there's everything in here. The malicious bug doesn't just change Casey, it also turns her entire house into a hive. Top-notch practical effects and excellent work from cinematographer Jeff Marr combine to create crystal-clear shots of the insect humanoid. Despite the uneasy scenes, one doesn't help but sympathize with Casey, who was scared of getting married, having babies, and starting a life, only to find that she doesn't have one anymore. In the climax, the makers left the scope of a sequel, and we'll guess it'll bite more bitterly if it comes to theaters. Splinter, 2008 Polly is an adventurist and insists she and her scientist boyfriend Seth go camping to celebrate their anniversary. Seth hesitantly agrees and they hit the road. The two begin to set up their tent when they're attacked by a prison escape dentist and his drug-addicted girlfriend Lacey. The two hold Seth and Polly at gunpoint and carjack them. Polly drives the car and hits a dog-like animal on the road. What the shit is that? We hit something. Lacey and Seth discover that the flattened body parts start moving, revealing it to be a fungal parasite that infects animals and humans of the sleepy town into zombies that grow splinters on their bodies. They become blood-hungry zombies and kill anything that moves. The four of them must forget their differences and work as a unit to outsmart the thorny virus and its victims. Writers Ian Shore and Kai Berry did not waste time beating around the origin and explanation of the viral parasite that infects its victims and takes control of their bodies, so much so that even when the body parts are mutilated, they ensemble and attack in their own capacity. Splinter is not as exploitative as the other films featured on this list, but it is adorned with its own charm. With great acting and a well-written script, the film successfully gives an adequate number of screams and chills for all the gorehounds. There's a scene in which a character's arms are mutilated with a knife no longer than a paper cutter. Another person's upper torso is separated from her body, but it later joins together to become a kill machine. In an appreciably small runtime of 82 minutes, the characters are not forced to do anything stupid and fight the creature with their brains and guts. As such, Splinter is surprisingly believable, and major credit must be given to Shia Wiggum, Paulo Costanzo, and Jill Wagner, who have acted beautifully as Dennis, Seth, and Polly. Steve. Virus, 1999. A week after a highly intelligent life form kills members of a Russian research vessel, it is found by an ocean going ship. Krusty and the greedy Captain Everton wish to salvage the abandoned ship, which could be worth hundreds of millions. All we have to do is tow her to safety, slap a salvage lien on her, and the Russian government has to pay us 10% of her value to get her back. While most of the crew is thrilled by the opportunity of making money, the Navigator Kid is the only one who objects to the idea. Soon they discover the Russian ship sole survivor Nadia, who warns them by saying, Lightning that can think, a new life form. You have the power. Shut down the ship. You're all in danger. They soon realize that this life form is turning itself into cyborgs and considers humans a virus. The tables soon turn from Captain Everton wanting to sell the ship's spare parts to the alien-fested ship using his members as spare parts. Virus is based on the comic book of the same name by Chuck Farr and is often compared with Deep Rising that released in the same year. You can check out our review on Deep Rising in our video titled 13 Deranged Tentacle Monster Movies that are extremely good. 
As a film, Virus has many flaws concerning direction and screenplay, but it is a decent effort as a body horror. The titular infection uses body parts of humans and combines them with the ship's metal scraps to form cyborgs that then go on a hunting spree. Dennis Feldman and Jonathan Hensley scribed the film, having written gems like Species and Con Air, but it wasn't very pleasant to see these master writers produce something so mediocre it had the potential of killing their careers. Nevertheless, Virus fares decently in terms of the transformation and icky factors. A walrus must learn to swim. <laughs> Tusk, 2014. Wallace and Teddy are noisy, energetic, and witty co-hosts of a podcast called The Not See Party, who crack dark and humiliating jokes on bizarre viral videos. And this is Wallace Brighton reminding you to join The Not See Party. Wallace sometimes travels around the world to interview the people who appear in them. His latest project lies in Canada, where a boy accidentally mutilated his leg and ended up dead. Fucking killed himself, sir, with his own fucking sword. You believe that shit? He stops at a bar before going home and finds a flyer that says a man is willing to tell the story. Intrigued, he visits the man where he is given a cup of tea laced with drugs and falls unconscious. The next morning brings terror when Wallace finds that his legs have been amputated. The host intends to turn him into a human walrus by carrying out medical procedures on him. Meanwhile, Teddy arrives in Canada and learns that this psycho is on the police's wanted list. Do you know what a fate worse than death is? If you don't, this film is your answer. Wallace is forcefully transformed into a walrus. That is body, mind, and instincts. He is operated upon, mutilated, and given a walrus outfit sewn from human skin. If weirdness was an aircraft, this film is like a rocket that shoots into the sky and doesn't know how to stop. Acclaimed makeup artist Robert Kurtzman has crafted this into another one of his masterpieces. What began as a hunt for comedy turns into final doom, and nobody has the last laugh. At its worst, this film by Kevin Smith will be forever unforgettable. We watched it before making the video and couldn't stop talking about the damn tusks for days. If the film's theme makes you uncomfortable, then watch it for the performances of Johnny Depp and Justin Long. I gotta get this thing finished and on the market while people still care, otherwise there's no point. Besides, you owe me for what you did to my rig. Antiviral, 2012. Sid March works for Lucas Clinic, a company that harvests pathogens from world-class celebrities and sells them to fans. Fans who think they will be closer to their icons by getting infected with the same diseases. These pathogens have a high demand in the black market as well. Sid steals and injects them into himself to become an incubator and carrier. Hannah Geist is a celebrity with a disease that he injects into himself, and it turns out that it is far deadlier and hence more valuable in the black market. Hannah dies and that increases the black market for it exponentially. We're cutting our last tray of Hannah Geist for the day. If you get a ticket, you can buy one three-ounce steak. If you don't get a ticket, you have to come back tomorrow. There's also a celebrity meat market where meat is grown from the cells of stars for human consumption. Have you ever seen a more organized form of cannibalism? There are some really nasty and gut-wrenching ideas in antiviral. Who could imagine a celebrity butcher shop or a business that thrives on making people fall sick with celebutant illnesses? Well, Brandon Cronenberg can, son of the body horror elder god David Cronenberg, who gave the subgenre its real position and made it grotesque and disturbing. Yes, the apple didn't fall far from the tree, and after watching the film, we wondered if talent and art flew genetically. The extent of innovative thinking shown by Cronenberg is overwhelming and dark. Yes, there are gory transformations and a gradual decay of certain characters. One of them drinks blood from a living arm. You see my cell garden? No. But none of that is even the fun part when you see a cell garden where body parts are grown and harvested for people to consume. Apart from the horror element, Cronenberg sends a deeper message and throws light on the ills of celebrity culture prevalent in the entertainment industry. It also focuses upon the stark differences between celebrities and the commoner. Tusk, 
Taxidermia, 2006. It's a surrealist comedy drama and horror that is a retake on Hungary's history in the post-war era, told through three generations of men of a Hungarian family. The first is of a sexually frustrated army man named Vendel, who goes into extreme rounds of self-indulgence while staring at his senior's wife and daughters. Then we are introduced to a morbidly obese speed-eater Kalman, who does great harm to his life but makes the country proud. And lastly, Lajos, who is the heir of Kalman and Vendel. Lajos is a desperate taxidermist who has submitted his life to carcasses. Taxidermia does regrettably honest justice to the meaning of the word bizarre. It doesn't feature a lot of body horror scenes, but the few that you will see remain with you for eternity. There's all kinds of nasty things happening. A character sodomizes a slaughtered pig, while another is ravaged and dismembered by hungry pet cats. You should wait for the part where human taxidermy is shown. It's an ode to human nature. It grimly speaks loudly about our desires and fetishes while being a fantastic horror comedy. In a reasonable runtime of 94 minutes, director Gyurgi Palfi shows a beautifully crafted film that is both compelling and immersive. Critics and fans worldwide have given largely positive reviews about taxidermia, which mirrors the artistic and technical genius employed in its making. Although it is beyond doubt that this film is not for the weak-hearted, or well, maybe not even for the weak-stomached. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give you a hand, Bill. <laughs> Society, 1989. Bill Whitney is a rich kid who lives in a mansion in Beverly Hills, California with his sister and parents. He has always felt he's different from his family as they mingle with the elite in society and he's more down to earth. One day, he's given a tape by his sister's ex-boyfriend Blanchard. The tape contains footage of a party where his family and their elite friends engage in a gruesome, murderous orgy. Bill tells this to Dr. Cleveland, but the tape seems to have been replaced. Uh, I need another copy of the tape. No, it can't wait. Please. Yeah. His family gets him sedated with the help of Dr. Cleveland, only for him to wake up at a formal party where the guests try to do heinous and dastardly things to Bill. Society won the 1990 Silver Raven Award for Best Makeup at the Brussels International Festival of Fantasy Film. It contains some really dark themes under the body horror subgenre. Society as a film talks about the horrid creatures that humans are under the garb of manners and etiquette. On a deeper look, director Brian Usna has sought to show his viewer the demise of humanity in the everyday people we see around us, and he does so in the cruelest of fashions. Elements of humor have been spread like breadcrumbs to attract the unsuspecting audience into its horrid last half hour. <laughs> oh, look, look. A beauty mark! <laughs> and once you're there, you just can't walk away from all the ghastly yet attractive special effects. Some critics hailed the film to be way ahead of its time and unforgettable, while others discarded it as extremely pretentious and obnoxious. When a movie garners such polar opposite responses, then it becomes both terrifying and amazing. To talk further about the transformations would mean giving away plot points, and we don't want to deface and disfigure this beautiful piece of prose for you. <laughs> Tetsuo the Iron Man, 1989. A metal fetishist comes to his dilapidated house, cuts open his thigh, and shoves a metal rod into it. Later, he discovers that the wound is decomposing and is filled with maggots. In a moment of hysteria, he runs down the street only to be struck down by a car. In another scene, we're introduced to a man and a woman whose flesh is slowly transforming into metal. Do these three have a common link? Where does it lead? Those who have even a passing knowledge of transformation horror and writer-director Shinya Tsukamoto would know that this is no Iron Man flying up in the sky. It is a way darker and more frightful rendition of being an Iron Man. Japanese cinema experimented with body horror in the 80s, and Tetsuo seems like the Frankenstein of Japanese horror, the only difference being it's ultimately a cyberpunk nightmare. Tsukamoto doesn't waste any time at building up the heat and suspense, starting with a gory scene of a man slitting open his thigh to slip in a metal rod. The genre follows soon, with the private parts turning into a drill or a metal hose. All of this is wrapped around sex and paranormal horror. The mind-boggling special effects make it an enriching horror experience. 
On a visceral level, the transformations are explicit and sickening, while on an emotional and psychological level, the viewer feels what it is like to lose control of their body or their identity as a whole. But then, isn't this exactly what we horror fans love in a film? This is all the time we had for today's episode. We hope you guys liked it. It would be awesome if you guys can take some time to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to tell us which topic you want us to cover in the comment section. Have a fantastic day ahead and stay safe!